Um, it's <coughs> unusual to have three space flyers uh, gathered together, and uh, so uh, I think it's, uh, it says quite a bit about this uh, gathering, this convention, that, uh, that it's uh, wonderful for all of us to come and talk to you. And I thought I would take this opportunity um, to, since we have three of us here, to ask about, you know, why? What is it about space? Why do we put uh, human beings in space? So um, usually the, the discussion about why we send people to space uh, centers on the debate of what's better, you know, our, our machines or our humans, uh, do, they, do machines or humans accomplish a mission better? And, and I would say that that's a legitimate question because machines uh, can be built to be stronger, they're, they're more durable, and they're more predictable. Um, they don't breathe, they don't eat, they don't poop, so you don't have to worry about you know, any of that stuff. And if they happen to be on a rocket or a spacecraft that blows up, you don't have to go to a funeral. So, um, I mean, th those are legitimate uh, advantages. Now, years ago, um, the counter arguments were that, you know, you just can't make a machine that is as capable as a human, right? They can't make complex decisions. Um, they can't take in the incredible uh, sources of information, uh, quantity and sources of information uh, that people can, and they can't control very complex dynamic systems. But nowadays, that's a pretty tough uh, argument to defend. You know, with advances in sensors and um, processors and AI, you know, the, uh, we see the technology in our everyday life that is arguably much better than, than human performance. And um, if any of you have been in these self-driving cars, and, and I, excuse me, and I have not, um, I really look forward to the day where we can really decrease the number of uh, road deaths, uh, traffic deaths, because that becomes uh, the standard. And I also guarantee that if you're sitting in an airplane seat um, at night, in the weather, high winds, low visibility, you want the autopilot to be flying the airplane more than, than the pilot. Um, so machines don't get tired. They don't want to get home to get to a birthday party and they don't let their egos affect their performance. So I think it's time we admit that you know, there, are machine, there are things that machines can do, uh, critical things that machines can do that are actually better than humans. And given the right uh, models, given the, the accuracy of the environment models, um, they're faster, they're more accurate, and they're far, far less variable than humans. There's a, there's a joke about the brand new spacecraft that's uh, been designed, and on the, on the control panel, there's just a single button that says abort. And, and the crew is a, is a pilot and a dog, and the, the pilot's job is to assess uh, the environment and the flight and make sure everything's going okay, and if it's not, hit the abort button. And the dog's job is to bite the pilot if they ever get anywhere near that abort button. So that's, that's the attitude, or that's our, that's our continued opinion about automation and, uh, and, and the role of, of very complicated machines these days. So I, I believe that machines are better at, at, at some things, but of course these machines are limited by the, the, uh, the, the engineers that design them and the programmers that program them. So um, is it possible that engineers will design uh, creativity and, and intuition and collaboration into these machines. I think there's an argument that we're headed that, that way. And it's not hard to imagine at some point that we'll have self-learning machines that will perform and I'll say think as well as humans. Now I don't know if that's in five years or 50 years, 500 years, but I believe that it's, uh, that's inevitable. We're on that path. So I'd like to think that, you know, space exploration is going to utilize a mixture of humans and machines, you know, call them robots because that's what we've Im imagined. And even before we sent uh, people into space, we imagined this collaboration between, between humans and robots. And um, there's, there's, there's an early example. 
Um, what's really interesting to me and I find ironic is that these robots that have been imagined uh, bring about probably the biggest limitation that uh, we humans have, and that's that we are human-shaped. And so I'm not exactly sure why the imagination of, of people is that uh, these incredible machines that are going to assist us in spaceflight are going to look like people. But even as a few recent as a few years ago, um, we flew this robonaut up to the International Space Station. I, I'm not trying to diss robonaut. I know <laughs> friends that worked on it, and uh, it's an it's an amazing machine. But I'm not sure why we're focused on this this humanoid. Uh, form factor. Sometimes we design robots to do exactly what we want them to do, and uh, they, they aren't limited by a form factor. We know exactly what the mission is, we know exactly what the environment is, and so uh, we have experience with these uh, incredible machines that do amazing work millions of miles from home, yet if you're like me and you've followed some of these missions, you wish that you could just take your finger and flick that piece of dust off the lens, or take your pinky and, and, and clean that drill bit with that little, uh, with the soil that's stuck on that drill bit. And so, you know, we can feel this want, this desire to uh, help machines or be the person uh, to, to uh, be there to assist. Um, I, I still am not convinced that we need the humanoid form factor uh, to be that uh, assistant. Well, there's another argument about putting people into space, and that's that uh, they can, people can deal with uh, unexpected circumstances, um, uh, things that we just didn't think about before, like uh, mirrors that were ground to the wrong specification, or uh, control moment gyros that need to be replaced, or mechanisms that get stuck. But in, in my mind, that's really a financial argument. Um, if you're gonna put a person at the place that needs to be fixed or needs to be assessed, uh, the expense to do that, uh, I would say, is arguably close to building a new satellite or telescope or rover. It's very expensive. And with the advances in telepresence and autonomy, I'm thinking that you know the, the, the pendulum might have swung, swung in that direction. So I, I'm saying that I think the typical battlefield of whether or not we should send people into space is a bunch of pros and cons. It's a bunch of, well, they do this better, they do this better. It's, 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 uh, it, it, it's financial, or it's logistic, or it's the capabilities, or it's the safety. It's, it's, a, it's a trade. And there's an attempt to put human spaceflight into some logical framework. So as somebody who's been lucky enough to spend months in space, I've developed a little theory of my own about why we send people into space. Um, and it's, it's this. We go to space because that's what we do as human beings. And there is something innate and primal about space and about flying. And sometimes I'm lucky enough to talk to kindergartners or even a little bit younger. And I love to go there and I like to to hold up a pencil and I go, hey, what happens if I drop this pencil? And everybody's like, it falls to the ground. And I go, why does it fall to the ground? Gravity is pulling it to the ground. They're four and five years old, and somehow this understanding of an invisible force that pulls things towards the ground is innate in them. It's, it's, I find it amazing. And they are wrapped, and they love to even think about or see on a video when you can take those gravitational forces away. So um, we on this panel are so lucky uh, to have lived the dream of so many of these children. And space is inspirational, it's a dream destination, and it's an, in an idea that is built into us. So I think that we are asking the wrong question. Rather than say, why do we need to put humans in space, I like to think, we need to put humans in space to ask why. People are going to go into space whether governments send people to space or not. I think NASA's contribution has been uh, and continues to be uh, to do the basic research and development of understanding this new frontier. But now that some of those questions have been addressed, 
we look forward to companies like Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic or the other ones to, uh, to fulfill the need, to fulfill the, the uh, demand for all of these people that need to go into space. We go into space because that's what humans do. We need to explore, we need to push boundaries, and we need to understand what we don't know so that we can continue to ask why. So I don't think it's useful to frame the question of why do we go to space in, a financial, in financial terms or in uh, who does things better terms, uh, even to talk about the discoveries that we do make as humans. I don't find that a compelling reason uh, to, to, a compelling answer to why do we put people in space. And I also don't believe in the spin-off technology uh, argument. I don't think that's a reason that we need to put people into space. I believe that asking why do we put people into space is very similar to asking why do we need to go visit Paris? Or, you know, why do we need to read? Or even, why do we need children? So, uh, uh, I think that these are uh, things that I, I think that these kinds of things, like uh, asking why do, we, why do we need to have children, is there any financial benefit in having children? The answer to that is absolutely no. And is there a real need to go to Paris? And the answer is yes. And so, <laughs> for many of us, we're all a little different. But these are things that we do as humans that are beyond logical justification. Um, these are innate motivations, drives, and desires that make us all human. And we, in this society, in this room, are just lucky enough to live in an era where technology has caught up to our aspirations. Thank you very much.